From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, another featured speaker from that K-State Symposium on Bovine Anaplasmosis. Out of the University of Missouri, Bill Stitch will talk about past and present efforts to develop vaccines for anaplasmosis prevention. That's challenging, he says, because of the various strains of the disease found in cattle. Also, timely bonus information from the latest Cattle Chat podcast from the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. This time, Brad White, Bob Larson, and Bob Weber will look at special management considerations for cow-calf herds now out on persistently wet pastures that have been slow in their growth. And further ahead, with another Stop, Look, and Listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. And we've yet another featured speaker at that second symposium on bovine anaplasmosis, hosted by K-State's College of Veterinary Medicine this week. Earlier we talked about the prevalence of this disease and its devastation in many circumstances to cattle herds when it really sets in. Of course, the uh, hope would be that there would be a preventative measure, if you will, against anaplasmosis. That is one of the objectives that our guest has been focusing on. He actually talked about vaccine protocols for anaplasmosis. He is from the University of Missouri's College of Veterinary Medicine, where he is a professor of parasitology there, Dr. Bill Stitch. Bill, first of all, your take on the importance of coming up with some sort of firm answer against this disease. It's been around for a while. A firm answer against this disease is is good management and and integrated management uh, where a vaccine is considered a tool and not a silver bullet that will prevent the disease in total. In fact, the vaccines that are available protect the animals from the disease, anaplasmosis, but I'm not aware of any vaccine that provides sterile immunity against the infection with anaplasma marginale. You gave a historical perspective on the attempts over the years to develop a vaccine response to anaplasmosis. In fact, the first vaccine for this very purpose, that's a hundred some years back, you say. Yes, Sir Arnold Tyler, who first described anaplasma marginale, developed that vaccine the following year. In ni- it was reported in 1911. That work was developed in South Africa. It's, it's actually a live vaccine where the, uh, the bovine host becomes infected with anaplasma centrale and then develops a protective immune response that will not block the anaplasma marginale infection, but will reduce the amount of clinical disease the host experiences upon infection with anaplasma marginale. That vaccine, unfortunately, is not available in the United States. We don't use a lot of uh, live vaccines here. Plus, the pathogen is not endemic to the United States. So we we cannot bring that in. It is used, however, in South America, Latin America, in South Africa, and Israel, other parts of the world. It is still a a useful vaccine, a useful tool. And that is part of what's been the ebb and flow of vaccine availability and protocol over the years. There have been other products out on the market likewise. Yes, there have been killed vaccines in the United States. Uh, the first one was developed in the mid-60s, and it was available until about uh, 1990. So it was available for quite a while. It was based on organisms isolated from a highly infected animal that were purified to a certain extent from the uh, red blood cells that these organisms live within. That vaccine also had a lot of antigens or a lot of material from the host cell red blood cells. Uh, So this material, when immunized into a cow with a different blood type, 
resulted in antibodies that would be in the colostrum. And so if that cow gave birth to a calf or nursed a calf with the same blood type as the vaccine donor, that would cause a problem of red blood cell lysis in that nursing calf. That was a major uh, problem and a major management challenge involving that vaccine. So another vaccine was developed in the 1980s and became available around 1990. And that, that particular vaccine was a better purification of the anaplasma marginale antigens, or better separation from the host cell antigens that were in the previous vaccine. So it resulted in reduced lysis of red blood cells in the, in the nursing calves, and that is still a safe vaccine. We're just not sure how protective it is against uh, different strains of anaplasma marginale as they occur in other parts of the United States. So that gets back to the overarching point. There's no firm answer yet in as far as a vaccine that can comprehensively get the job done. No, unfortunately, there is no vaccine that is perfect in the sense that it will provide complete protection against the disease and certainly not the infection. The vaccine's that have limited license through the USDA, they also have limited utility. They may not necessarily be protective against a strain of anaplasma in any specific part of the country. It's, it's really a guess. So it's, it's still useful as a sort of as insurance, but it should not be done at the expense of other precautions such as judicious use of tetracyclines and appropriate management with clean needles and control of arthropod vectors, ticks, as well as uh, horse flies that can mechanically transmit the, the pathogen between animals. You mentioned tetracyclines, which are the common treatment response, and that's been another issue with vaccines, making sure they're compatible products, right? With a live vaccine, yes, you have to be careful when treating with tetracyclines around the time of giving a live vaccine. Uh, because that would be counterproductive, killing the, the organism in the live vaccine with the tetracycline. So the general guidelines, as I understand them, is approximately one week prior to the dose received to six weeks afterwards. Things like tetracycline, chloramphenicol, and midocarb should be avoided. However, also with these live vaccines, you also have to be aware that sometimes clinical disease can develop, especially in older animals. And so you, these animals have to be monitored, and if clinical signs of anaplasmosis appear, they should be treated with tetracycline anyway, whether it's been six weeks or not. Well, this is a complicated quest, but researchers aren't giving up on the notion that a vaccine product could be developed in the future or a set of products that can respond to anaplasmosis. The research will go on. Yes, absolutely. Hope springs eternal. So... There are still a lot of, of good people, uh, such as here at Kansas State, who are trying to tease apart this mystery of cross-protection with different strains of anaplasma marginale. Also, work is still underway to try to develop strains of the organism and culture that are not virulent and will offer the, the benefits of a, of a live vaccine. There are some benefits to a live vaccine without all of the uh, disadvantages. Uh, also, there is still work, or there should still be work, towards what's called a defined or subunit vaccine, which is based on recombinant antigens that are recognized by immune response of uh, protected bovine host. If we stick to it and we, if we remain diligent in these efforts, I do believe eventually we will have effective, safe, effective vaccines for controlling the disease. Bill, you were asked a question, and it gets to your background as a parasitologist, about the vectors of anaplasmosis. Primarily, we hear about ticks. Flies can also serve in that capacity, but ticks seem to be the real object in this charge against anaplasmosis. Can something be done about the tick population? Can tick control serve as an answer here? Yes, it can. And, and in fact, historically, vector control has been extremely important in control of diseases that are caused by pathogens transmitted by vectors. Uh, just think about mosquitoes and malaria or yellow fever and how mosquito control made construction of the Panama Canal possible. 
Also, control of ticks around a home environment can reduce the likelihood of exposure to the the spirochete that causes Lyme disease. Similar with uh, cattle and ticks, there are approaches to uh, control the ticks themselves. Uh, Some of those approaches involve pesticides, heavy use of pesticides, to uh, kill the ticks in other parts of the world. Animals are actually dipped in these uh, pesticides, they're called acaricides, to control the ticks. And what's starting to develop, as you might predict, because biology is very clever, some tick resistance to these acaricides or acaricide resistance has been developing worldwide. So these, these approaches, at least with the chemicals, are not as sustainable as we would hope. There is work being done to uh, use the host immune response against the tick with things such as uh, antigens that the host is not normally exposed to as the tick feeds. And so when we immunize the host with these antigens, they develop antibodies that will attack those molecules inside the tick and could affect the tick feeding or reproduction. Some of those vaccines have been developed and are, are in use in other parts of the world To my knowledge, we don't have one in the United States yet, but I think it will come here eventually. We will have those products. The message here, there are no easy answers, but integrated management and and approaches seem to be the response of the day anyway, as far as producers are concerned and researchers are seeking to enhance those methods even more. Absolutely. In fact, that perspective of anaposmosis control, in my opinion, has not changed over the last 50 years. Bill, your presentation was greatly appreciated at the symposium, as are these comments here. Thanks for sharing a few moments with us on this important topic. Thank you very much for your kind words, and it's my my pleasure and my honor to be here. Bill Stitch, he's a professor of parasitology at the University of Missouri College of Veterinary Medicine, and he brought an update on vaccines as a response to anaplasmosis in cattle at the Anaplasmosis Symposium hosted this week by K-State's College of Veterinary Medicine. Agriculture Today continues in a few moments on this, the K-State Radio Network. Stay with us. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global Food Systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, this week we have a bonus edition of the Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State, in large part this time addressing some issues associated with our ultra-wet pasture conditions around Kansas and managing the cow herd accordingly. On board this time, K-State cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, veterinarian Bob Larson, and the podcast moderator, the director of the BCI, Brad White. We're going to talk about a couple issues that we don't have great answers for, but people deal with. One, what do we do with our thin cows when we're right upon breeding time? Two, how do we deal with that forage base that, as it was dry last year, may have got a little bit short? We're coming into this year, got damaged with some of the the water coming into spring. We'll talk about those. We're going to address a, a listener question. But I want to jump in, and we're right at breeding time. We may have people sinking cows. We've got people turning in bulls. If my cows are thin today, what can I do? I I do hate this question in that it's really not a good situation in that I don't expect those cows to perform well and that they very very well may not have resumed uh, fertile cycles yet. And if they're thin today, they may not for several weeks. So it, it really is a challenge. I mean... The good thing is green growing grass is coming on, and that stuff is magic. It will really help those cows start to put some body condition on and start to recycling, coming back with some fertile cycles. But we're still talking several weeks away. But that's my best answer is, well, put them on green growing grass, put them on the best forage you've got. And if, um, depending on the situation, 
may need to supplement if you don't have green growing grass to put them on yet or want to hold or, off on that just a little bit. Or an adequate supply of that green growing grass. Yeah, or, or, yeah. there's so just I mean, not inventory. enough out there yet. Yeah. It's it's coming on, but it's not abundant yeah. yet. It's been a late cool spring. So if you're talking about supplements, are you, are you thinking a forage supplement? I should try to put something forage-based out there? Or should I try to get some protein? Should I try to get some energy? What's my main concern with these cows at this point? And, they're, and, and let's assume they're spring calving. They've got a calf by their side. They're lactating. Yeah, the problem is a lot of the guys I've talked to, there's not a lot of forage available yeah. to put in front of them. So you're talking about maybe a low quality forage plus a supplement. And so basically it depends on how low the protein is in the forage. If it's a low protein forage, then you're going to have to start with some protein supplementation. If the protein in the forage that I'm putting in front of them, so that might be you know some older hay or something like that. If it's still adequate, then mostly energy, getting some extra calories in it. Too. So the problem is again there's no easy answer and there's no one answer uh, you're gonna have to know a little bit about the forage you're putting in front of them i wish i had some you know some good alfalfa or something to put in front of them but i haven't talked to very many guys that have that available right now so, yeah so some like some of the either fiber friendly soy hulls that kind of stuff that's got protein and energy you know corn distillers or milo distillers still a really good choice just from an energy and protein you'll probably overfeed them a little bit on protein but the extra energy that goes with it's um, really really helpful this time of year on those those cows so they they biologically or metabolically look like they're on an increasing plane of nutrition that'll help stimulate those cows to cycle and and settle so absolutely and we're not gonna if they're thin now bringing them back to good body condition while they're lactating is not gonna work but i can hopefully maintain and this is a place to do some math and do some thought as far as we're, we're throwing out general ideas but if this is an issue on your operation have a strategy, work with someone that either your Has nutritionist, some, your veterinarian, combo of both. And, and, and say specific local knowledge of what's, what yeah, you've got. What here's you've got here's our plan. Here's what we've got available. How do we do it? Because some of this supplement that we're talking about, we can feed too much. It can be costly. They're, they're not as efficient with it or maybe the wrong thing. So, so have a plan, have some strategy, which also ties into our next topic because our next topic that we wanted to talk about, which is just as challenging, and, and I'll describe the situation here, which I think was not unique throughout the country, is last summer we were really, really dry, and a lot of our pastures got overgrazed toward the end of the grazing season, and we grazed them down to the end. We had a long winter now we've come, and at least here locally in the Midwest, we've had a lot of rain. And now, as those cows get out early on those pastures that were overgrazed, they're really wet. They haven't come back on. It's easy to tear up those pastures. So how do I deal with that forage base? I mean, it, it's challenging at this yeah, point. You gave us another challenging one, but, but one that I'm, I'm seeing as well. In the, again, we're, we're anxious to get those cows out, get them on forage, and there's not as much out there as you might think. We've had you know, definitely not a drought situation around here. Uh, we've had a good wet spring, but I'm really kind of concerned about tearing up the pasture that I've got because there's not enough forage base to, to really maintain the, the cows out there working it up. So some of the options are to actually feed my supplement, but use some electric fence or something and, and keep them to one part of the, the pasture so they don't tear the whole thing up. Kind of sacrifice a chunk. Yeah, kind of sacrifice a chunk. And then you might have to come back in and and, and refurbish that part of the pasture. So, it, again, you're kind of dealing, you've got a bad hand. Now you're going to have to figure out how to play that bad hand of we don't have the grass we want right now. In fact, I'm, I'm actually kind of concerned about causing additional damage down the road. Yeah, one one thing to think about too is if you if you do have to put out some forage uh, or some hay, maybe unroll some prairie hay, maybe some mature prairie hay, and sort of think about uh, seeding it, the reseeding, right? Yeah. So if you have to do this on a warm season chunk of ground, make sure you put out prairie hay and not brome or something like that in that spot because you're going to get some seeding that happens because well, of that. I was just going to note, but sometimes I've seen that go pretty negative. Uh, particularly, maybe I ship some hay in from someplace else and I bring in new weed seeds well, that we haven't had here before. That was actually going to be my. Gosh. My next point is really monitor some of those areas that you use as a feeding ground, maybe over winter and spring, and may maybe, have to put some herbicide on it to control treatment. weeds yeah. and may, harrowing out those uh, uh, hay rings and, and getting that stuff cleaned up. And harrowing does a, a, a pretty nice job sometimes smoothing those up too. 
I, I think the other thing to think about, and I would jump in, and one, one of the things I've been thinking about is some of the annuals mm-hmm. that you could put out and either intercede if the pasture is really sparse, or if I do have an area that was torn up, I still have the opportunity at this time of year to put in some of our summer annuals, and there it may be of a Ford sorghum, a sorghum sedan, pearl millet, foxtail millet, something like that, and maybe a mix in that. So if I have an area that has either been torn up through the winter or has been damaged this spring, I may want to overseed that. Now, that doesn't help me for next year. I need to plan in the fall, but I may get some forage production in those areas, and I would say figure out what's best in your area, and we still have some time to do that because our soil temperatures around here haven't actually been high enough yet that the summer annuals were are ready to go. We also had a question from our listener, and we appreciate those questions. So anytime you have a question, you can email us at bci at ksu.edu. But we wanted to address that question, and, and Bob, I'll let you read that question from the listener or paraphrase what, what they were asking about. All right, we have a, a question from a, a producer in southern Missouri. And basically his question was about ear tagging. He said exactly where on the ear should the ear tag be placed and if you have to re-tag an animal, should you put it in the existing hole or make a new hole? Now, I've been through southern Missouri. I actually worked in that area for a while, and I can kind of picture what's going on here. There's some pretty brushy areas. We, You know, here in Kansas, a lot of times you can put a tag in a cow, and it's going to stay for her life. But uh, there's some places in southern Missouri where uh, there's a lot of places for that tag to get snagged on and get pulled out. So re-tagging becomes an issue. I was always taught to make a new hole. This reader says that's what he was taught as well, but he's running out of space on the ear. Running out of holes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's less than ideal. But, yeah, I was always taught to put a new hole in. I'm not sure that that's actually gospel, but that's what I was taught. And and I think there's some truth to that as far as better longevity in the, in the second tag if it's put in a new hole versus in the old hole. So very similar to any piercing like an earring as you as you make that hole when they have that hole where that previous tag was it heals around that tag and so that hole is gonna is gonna stay it'll probably be a little bit wider if the tag got ripped out or pulled out depends on how that tag was so i agree with making a new hole positioning ideally you'd put it in the pretty middle, close to the center yeah, yeah in the middle of the ear and there's ribs in that ear and so a lot of times you go between those two middle ribs in about the mid part of the ear that's the right spot i would agree with with making a new hole weber what do you think yeah i think new hole too and and i like the sort of think about like a tic-tac-toe crosshatch thing mm. and put it in the middle hole oh. right so the two ribs horizontally Stick it in the middle. Um, I think one of the challenges can be, depending on brand of tag you get, how big the hole gets. You know, in some cases, the the one-piece tags kind of tend to waller out a pretty good size hole in some cows. And replacing with the same tag in that hole, they just pull right through. Um, so you may have to change tag type and used a, a post and, and uh, or a pen type tag um, that's got a bigger back on it to keep it from pulling through some of those holes i like a new hole if you can find space space. to do it yeah Yeah, it's it's a real challenge when you've used up the real estate right and and i would say look for areas because we have seen this and you're right there's brushy areas and there are also other things twines on round bales or netting on round bales if we don't get all that off or there may be specific areas in the pen where they're rubbing and i've seen that before Mm -hmm. where they're taking those tags out so if you can find specific obstacles and remove the issue not always can you, right. but if you well, can, that helps. Yeah, v, v mesh, woven wire, things like that can be really Hard disastrous on tags. On yeah. tags so, absolutely. And yeah. K State's Bob Larson, Bob Weber, and Brad White. The full podcast available at beefcattleinstitute.org. Beefcattleinstitute.org. This is Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States, providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension.
You're listening to Agriculture Today, our Wednesday edition, and thanks once more for joining us. Eric Atkinson here. Now today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, yesterday the USDA said its new round of trade aid for producers is being designed to avoid skewing planting decisions after soybean prices fell yesterday. That following a Bloomberg report with details on the aid package, Bloomberg reporting that the USDA would announce $15 billion in aid, uh, that would be tomorrow, that would pay farmers $2 a bushel for soybeans, $0.63 cents a bushel for wheat, and $0.04 cents a bushel for corn. That report cited two people familiar with the payment levels. According to the Bloomberg report, payments would be based on this year's planted acreage. The administration says the report is considering basing payments on the acreage farmers plant this year and their historic yield of crops per acre, according to Bloomberg's sources. Now, while corn continued its weather rally yesterday, moving up six cents in the December contract, November beans fell nine cents after the report came out. USDA's communications office declined to confirm details reported in the Bloomberg article, but also stated that farmers should not plant based on the aid program. Quoting the USDA spokesperson, details on the new trade mitigation program will be forthcoming shortly, but we want to be clear that the program is being designed to avoid skewing planting decisions one way or the other. The USDA spokesperson went on to say in its email to DTN that farmers should continue to make their planting and production decisions with the current market signals in mind rather than some expectation of what a farming support program might or might not look like. Under last year's market facilitation program, producers received $1.65 a bushel for beans, 14 cents a bushel for wheat, and one cent a bushel for corn. Now, Senator Jerry Moran of Kansas wrote USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue earlier this week about trade, calling for a resolution with China, but also asking that the USDA not affect planting decisions with this new aid package. He said, quoting the senator, farmers planting for the market and not government programs has been a central tenet of farm policy for over two decades. He went on to write, it's important this principle continue to be followed and for trade payments not to distort planting decisions. Moran explained that this could be accomplished if the USDA based payments on recent farm history of planted acres and yields on the higher of actual 2018 yields or average yield history on the farm. A USDA official updated members of Congress yesterday about work to keep African swine fever from infecting the U.S. pork industry. The Undersecretary of Marketing and Regulatory Programs for the USDA, Greg Eibach, told lawmakers that the USDA has stepped up biosecurity and import control efforts for ASF, but Eibach also emphasized the disease is difficult to control once it would arrive. African swine fever has hit hard in China, which has the world's largest swine herd. The disease does not affect people, is not a food safety concern. However, it infects both domestic and wild hogs and can be transmitted by feed or other contaminated objects because ASF has a high environmental tolerance. In China, the disease has wiped out roughly 20 percent of the pork herd there. U.S. Meat Export Federation officials said yesterday they're currently seeing little impact in major Chinese cities, but that the global food trade expects that China will eventually have significantly lower pork supplies. In Washington yesterday, House Agriculture Committee Chairman Colin Peterson said livestock producers learned their lessons from the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak back in 2015. That was one reason he supported mandatory funding for USDA to improve its disease preparedness. Now, Eibach went on to say it could take up to eight years to find a vaccine that will work on ASF. African swine fever has uh, proven to be a tough disease to uh, find a cure for or a vaccine for, and even uh, to uh, understand completely uh, how we can uh, decontaminate or disinfect a premises once uh, it uh, becomes uh, present in in uh, that uh, building or facility. On the vaccine side of things, uh, we still believe we may be as long as eight years uh, from uh, finding a vaccine that's effective. We're working on diagnostics right now in cooperation with Canada through ARS uh, research to try to uh, uh, have... Uh, 
different uh, tools available to us to determine if uh, the disease is present in a population. IBOX stressed USDA has stepped up its efforts to work more closely with the pork industry to improve biosecurity measures and to educate producers how to minimize the risks. The USDA also has begun to work more closely with U.S. Customs and Enforcement to inspect imports and people returning from China. If ASF arrives in the U.S., it could possibly be curbed, he says, but the impacts will be felt in a variety of ways, including export bans. The nation's animal disease traceability program is designed to reduce the number of animals and response time involved in a disease investigation. Todd Domer reports here that the USDA and state animal health officials soon will begin transitioning the official method of identification. USDA is beginning the process of moving from metal identification tags to electronic tags as part of the national traceability system. The transition is projected to take four years. Starting January 1st of 2023, only official radio frequency identification or RFID tags will be accepted for cattle and bison moving interstate. This includes breeding cattle 18 months and older, rodeo and show cattle, all female dairy cattle, and all male dairy cattle born after March 11th of 2013. The implementation timeline begins December 31, 2019, when USDA will discontinue providing free metal tags. Approved vendors still will be permitted to produce and sell official metal tags for one additional year if approved by specific state animal health officials. Vendor production of metal tags no longer will be authorized as of January 1st of 2021, with veterinarians and producers required to start using RFID tags. Two years later, on January 1st, 2023, RFID tags will be required for the specified classes of cattle moving interstate. At that time, animals with metal ear tags will have to be re-tagged with RFID tags for interstate movement. Feeder cattle and animals moving directly to slaughter currently are not subject to individual identification requirements. I'm Todd Domer. And that's a glance at today's agricultural news headlines. Once more, we invite you to check out our podcast service and take advantage of the flexibility in listening to our program that would provide. You can find out more at agtoday.net, agtoday.net. And this is Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. The town will be empty without the students. And parking will be easy. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. This past weekend was a yearly returning, very special weekend for Manhattan. The town will run dry as students are leaving or already have left town. Yes, Saturday and Sunday, the graduation ceremonies were held. The commencement speakers gave their speeches, some which might be remembered and some not. Families have come together and photos were taken each year. It is more or less the same with different players. What I always have liked is the exodus of loaded pickups or horse traders, some horse traders filled with horses while most hauled student furniture. You see them going in all directions, away from Manhattan, like an extended spider web. 
On Friday afternoon, we were coming back from Salina, having delivered and planted a redbird tree. We found a beauty at a local nursery for the location I had drawn in on the landscape plan for my daughter. The idea was to get it in the ground before the expected weekend rain. As with all the shrubs planted the day before, we got it all done in time and enjoyed a quick cup of tea before driving home. On the way home, I saw the loaded pickups. The weekend did bring rain and some sunshine. Perfect weather for newly planted shrubs and trees. The town will be empty without the students. Parking will be easy. But it's only for a short time and the summer classes will start. However, in summertime, it is never as busy as during the regular school year. With all the graduation ceremonies behind them, I wonder what students will remember, really remember, of the commencement speeches they heard. I wonder what I would have told them. The one thing I could have shared is that, from my perspective, be ready for the curveball thrown at you. For a starter, there is no guarantee you will reach old age. Oh yes, wise men have advised to plan ahead, set goals, etc. But be realistic. Make sure that you start each day with some happiness. Stay in touch with friends, especially those friends which have some difficulties getting started. Help each other. They too will get these curveballs tossed at them. It is true that life at times will look like a Greek tragedy. But you must go on. I hope you have taken courses and a study direction which you feel will give you satisfaction in your daily work. There's nothing wrong with work, not even hard work. Looking as the loaded pickup trucks passed on the other side of I-70, now going home, I wondered how many of them would climb on the tractor or in the saddle, doing the farmer's or rancher's job for which they studied, or perhaps not, but returning home for the summer months to help with all the summer tasks at the home place. There ain't time to see the wheat grow and ripen, then help with the harvest driving trucks or combine. Driving home is a good feeling, or so it should be. It does not matter if you don't have the passion to step in your parents' footsteps. We're all individuals. If farming or ranching is in your blood, just call yourself lucky that you can drive to the home place. But talking about curveballs, last Saturday I drove with my grandson to our farm. The land is like a sponge. Water was seeping out of the hills everywhere. I wore my rubber boots. He wore his waterproof army boots. There's no way one could take equipment onto the land. Sure, there was no need to. The cattle are grazing, plenty of grass, and the brome is growing. It should be a tall hay crop this summer, and there still is the 20 acres we cannot get to as half the road is gone. Too wet to get down the creek and rebuild the road. It's just... Another curveball, one of many. As was the fact, we did not burn. Too wet, too windy, no time, no manpower. What I do hope you learned and could think about as you drive home is thinking. Just plain thinking and keeping your head straight when too many curveballs are thrown at you. Decision making is one very important aspect of an education. For as long as you live, you will have to make decisions. Part of that is having perhaps choices. A good education can help you sort out the choices you have to make. A few weeks ago, I made a statement to not forget to listen to granddad or grandma. Even your parents know a lot. They all have been there, done that. Yes, times have changed. My grandson used his cell phone to quickly learn how to take the wheel 
of the garden tractor which had a flat. It was simple once you read how to do it. Oh yes, I've taken the big tires of the John Deere tractor and heaved them into the pickup to have the flat fixed in town. No more. Been there, done that. But to use your cell phone to get quick information on how to do a job easily, I love it. The trouble is, I don't carry a cell phone. I'm not of this age. Oh yes, I have one more piece of advice for the graduates. Keep living simple and pay off your student loan before you buy the new truck. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on life in rural Kansas. And so goes our Wednesday edition. We appreciate you tuning in and hope you'll return to be with us again right here tomorrow. Meantime, Eric Atkinson bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.